felt like the Lord put it on my heart. I don't really preach about this near as much as I should, to be truthful to you. Uh, I've prayed many a time that the Lord would cause a burning in my heart, that I would have a hunger and a desire to preach the, preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, as much as I preach the cross. I mean, God just planted something in my heart to preach the cross. And so we're going to preach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. I titled my message, I don't always title messages, but I titled my message this morning, Fields of Flame. You know, I've become a little bit of a, what you'd call a theme preacher, I believe, but as the Lord has opened up my eyes and allowed me to see that there's multiple themes that run through both of the covenants, the old covenant, the new covenant, and that they tie and bring unity to the entirety of the scriptures. I try to make you aware of that. I bring these things up all the time, right? But one prevalent theme that we find in the Word of God is the theme of harvest. We see the, the, word, the, the theme of harvest even in the words that were given to Adam whenever the Lord told Adam to dress and to keep the garden. We see harvest in the Levitical feasts, the feast of first fruits and the feast of weeks, which is synonymous with Pentecost. We see harvest in the nation of Israel herself and the fact that she was an agrarian or an agricultural nation and she depended upon the former and the latter rains. I've talked to you about that many times. You know, Egypt, they would wait every year for the Nile River to flood and then it would come back, it would recede. And it, that's why they call it the Delta because it, it, it gave them a rich soil to plant their seeds in. But Israel was dependent upon God. Israel was dependent upon God that the heavens would not be brass and that he would pour down the former and the latter rains. Spiritually, most of us who are, uh, if you would say, Pentecostal, believe that the former and the latter rains represent the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but I'm going to move forward with my message and we're going to talk about a latter day outpouring also. We see in the story of Ruth and Boaz. That it takes place at harvest time. In this story, Boaz is a type of Jesus because the Bible calls him the kinsman redeemer and Ruth is his Gentile bride. We see harvest in the Old Testament prophets as they warned the people of God that because of sin that was in their lives, that the palmer worm and the canker worm was going to eat up and destroy their harvest and the prosperity that God had given them. We see harvest in the parable of the sower, and we see harvest in the parable of the wheat and tares. You know, I've just found that there's so much beauty in the Word of God, and so much of His love is revealed to anyone who's, willy, who's really willing to, to truly dig and to find yeah. the truth of His Word. Amen? Right. Yeah. I mean, when you just begin to ponder and try to comprehend the fact that when He created, when He gave Israel these Levitical feasts, and we taught, we teach them a lot. We've talked about them a lot. But, but that feast, uh, when, when it happened on, on, on unleavened bread, which began Passover, you know, and I've already alluded to it where they killed that innocent lamb and they covered their doorposts with blood. And God told them, he said, if I, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And judgment fell upon Egypt that night. And the firstborn died where there was not blood painted on the doorposts. And we know that Egypt is a type of the world. And that just as judgment came on Egypt, judgment will also come upon this world. But God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And hallelujah, 1,500 years approximately later, how can it just be accidental that God would allow his only begotten son to die on the Passover night to become the Paschal Lamb? Not an accident. Not an accident that three days later would be the first Sunday, the first day of the week after the last Sabbath, which was the Feast of First Fruits, that Jesus would resurrect from the dead. Come on. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Not an accident that 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits would be the day of Pentecost, and God would allow His Holy Spirit to be poured out upon all, upon all of them, and that they would speak with other tongues, and that they would be filled with the power of God to preach the gospel, hallelujah, so that souls would be won into the kingdom. Amen. There's going to be a great harvest upon this earth one day. Yes. There's going to be a great harvest of human souls, but there will also be great wrath poured out upon the disobedient who rejected God's word. Amen. Does that still cause a little bit of a trouble to our heart? 
Do we still sometimes lose a, bit, a little bit of sleep knowing that the soul is out there that don't know? Do we still believe what the Word of God says about people that don't know the Word of God? Do we still believe that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun? Or have we become so complacent in this modern church venue that we've been living in and the things that we've been watching on TV that we've forgotten that God is real and that, that, that sin will destroy and that God will have to judge sin and if they have not received Christ as their Lord and Savior they will stand and face God and they will answer for their own sin before Him. And just like Adam and Eve they will stand naked before the Lord. They will be exposed. It is our job it's not the people next door. It's not your neighbor next to you. It is our job to let others know yeah. the truth about Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. I can remember well when the Lord first put it on my heart. I was thinking, you know, when I was going to another church, I was thinking, man, you know, God's called me to tell other people about Jesus. I can't shrink the pastor down and stick him in my pocket. And then whenever I get over to the church, right, pull him out and put some more water on him and let him explode. Now, come on, get him, brother. You know? The only reason I say that, I don't know if you've, have you ever been in a church where people preach about personal evangelism? Lately, I'm just saying. Like, I've been in big churches, I've been in other churches where people preach about personal evangelism and everybody starts getting stiff. I know I've talked to y'all about that before, don't get stiff. Don't, don't get uncomfortable, amen? We're supposed to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, there's going to be a harvest that comes from the earth one day, and, and this crop that's growing is explained in John 12 and 24. It says in John 12 and 24, this is Jesus speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn, which is another word for seed of wheat, fall into the ground and die, it will abide alone. But if it dies, it will bring much fruit. Jesus is talking about the fact that he, like a seed, would be planted in the ground. And just as he, like a, his dead body. Like a seed that would be buried in the ground. And then just like a refreshing rain that would come. The power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 11. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can also quicken your mortal body. And the Holy Spirit would be like a refreshing rain that would... That would Rain upon that soil and Jesus, like a germinating seed, would sprout up out of that ground, bust up out of that grave, hallelujah, and we would see the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which it once again was the feast of first fruits, and it's a promise to us that there's a resurrection for the children of God, for the church of God that awaits them. Amen? There's going to be a day when there will be no more crying, there will be no more heartache, there will be no more sorrow. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yes. That brings me to point number one. I only got two points this morning. <laughs> point number one is this, working together with him in his harvest. I just really want to talk to you a little bit about the parable of the talents. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read one verse, Matthew 25, verse 14. I'm talking about the parable of the talents. You know, a talent was was a big old block of silver is what it was. I've seen a bullion of silver before. My brother-in-law had one. I picked that thing up. It was heavy. He told me it weighed about 80 pounds. And whenever I, whenever I looked it up, that's about what a talent of silver was, about 80 pounds of silver. And so in this story, it says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. So what I just want to get across to your mind, first of all, is that, in my opinion, as I've studied the scriptures, and somebody might have, you know, if you've got something different that you want to share with me, you know, we're all open for, for, for people sharing. But the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God seem to me to be very synonymous with one another. It's just a little bit of a different terminology. I think sometimes people kind of get caught up in that. But, you know, the truth is this, is that whenever Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, what we're talking about is not so much what's going on in heaven, don't get me wrong, a lot of things are going on in heaven, but that God is, is planning for his kingdom to be upon this earth. God is, is he's, all the work that he's doing is the plan that one day his kingdom is going to be established upon this earth. Amen? He says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man who traveled into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. What a plan. 
You know, if you go and you read the story, he gave five talents to one of them. He gave three talents to another and he gave one talent to the last one. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned in here, because it says that he gave to them what they could handle. You know, I always used to like it whenever I'm, I always use Robert as an example. I think he, he's already given me permission. I know I've told you all that. But, you know, whenever the Lord got a hold of Robert the first time in, or after the Lord had been getting a hold of him, he would have a desire to tell people about Jesus. Hallelujah. He would have a desire to tell people about Jesus. And even after we had been in the Bible study for a while, he'd say, man, I'm starting to really have a desire to, to when I'm talking to people, to lay hands on them and pray for them. Praise God. You know, and, and but and, but then, you know, what was happening is, is that all of a sudden people started saying, I think you, you're supposed to be a preacher. No, he, he said, and he said, I, it would be grieved in my spirit because I didn't feel like I was called to preach the gospel. The reality of it is, is that, no, we've all been called to be witnesses. Amen. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're not necessarily all going to do it the same way. Our personalities are different. Our makeup is different. You're, everybody's not going to be as vocal as Matt. Everybody's not going to be as quiet as some. But the reality of it is, is this, is that God has called us all to be a witness. That's what these talents represent. What has God given to each man? He's not going to give you more than what you can handle. If you can handle five, he's going to give you five. If you can handle three, he's going to give you three, two, two. And if he gives you one, he's expecting that you're going to do what you're supposed to do with the one. And the one with the five, he doubled it and he got five more. And the one with the three, he doubled it. But the one with the one, he took it and he, the Bible says he buried it because he was hiding it in the dirt. Now, whenever the man came back to settle accounts, and listen, this is Jesus. He's gone on a long journey, amen. He told the disciples in John chapter 14, he said, let your heart not be troubled. He said, I go to my father's house where there are many mansions. I go before you to prepare a place for you. And if it wasn't so, I would not tell you that. Jesus has gone on a long journey and he waits the time when he will come back as a bridegroom for his bride. He's looking for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle, but he's coming back. Amen. That's right. And this parable tells us that before he left, he left with each one what he knew that they could handle. When you got saved and gave your life to Christ, God gave you something that he expected you to do something with. But that one man, he just took it and he hid it in the ground. Lord, help us that we not take it and hide it in the ground. Lord, help us. Amen. I can remember not that long ago, the Lord was dealing with my heart. I was just thinking about all of the, the, the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions of all of us as Christians. You know, and, and to be truthful, to tell you the truth, there's sometimes I think, I mean, there's a couple of preachers in the house. And, you know, I would, I would venture to say that they would probably agree with me that there's times that you just don't feel like getting up and doing it. And sometimes you look around, I don't even know why I'm saying this. This, this is not pointing the finger at anybody, trust me. Sometimes you look around and you see people absent. Oh, okay, well, you know, my tummy hurt or, you know, I, whatever going on. I'm not trying to pick on everybody. I'm just trying to say, I'm just trying to make a point because maybe other preachers don't say this because they're kind of a little bit worried that you're going to get frustrated. But let me just say this. So, you know, you look around and you notice that people are absent. And you're like, well, guess what? My tummy hurt yesterday. I'm just saying, my, I felt a little under the weather. And all I'm trying to get at is this, is that we've all been called to do a certain thing. And I can remember whenever I was going through some things in my life and I, and I could feel the pressure of the enemy. Yes. And he'll try to whisper in your ear, man. He doesn't just whisper to preachers either. He'll try to whisper to a believer. He'll try to whisper to you. It's just not worth it. You don't have to keep on going. Yes. And I remember that scripture about the man who removed his hand from the plow. And I started praying. I said, Lord. Don't let my hand come off the plow. Amen. Lord, I pray that you weld my hand to the plow. Mm -hmm. Because there's a harvest yes. that must be had. Amen. Amen. There's a harvest that the Lord is looking for. And he's given to each man a talent. And he's asked each man to do what it is to be faithful and to be a good steward with what it is that he has given. But this one man hid his talent. In the, and Jesus, is, this is basically who the parable is. Jesus says, why did you hide my talent, you wicked Servant. He said, well, he said, I was fearful that, you, that, I, that, I, that I would lose it. Hmm. And he said, why didn't you at least put it, and the wording is in the bank. See, even back then, he said, why didn't you put it in the bank where I could have got some usury off of it? In other words, why didn't you just put it in a savings account and got me 2% interest on this thing, and I could have made a little bit of money off of my money because this was my money, but you didn't put it in there. Why did you hide it? 
Well, the only reason thing I can think of why he would have hid it is because he didn't want it to be recorded. Because you see, in order for the talent to actually gain usury or, or interest, it would have had to have been recorded that it was there. I believe, I can't prove this, but I believe that he didn't really believe that his master was coming back. He thought he could just dig that talent up in the, in the ground and cover it up and wait for the time whenever the time was right to spend it. But no, his master came back and found him wanting, found him that he had not been faithful with what God had entrusted him with. You know, there was a famous preacher one time. I used to love hearing this guy and his quotes. He had a British accent. Well, he said some good things. I remember one time he was talking about John the Baptist and he said, and on that day at the Jordan River, John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he said, and I believe that that voice reverberated through the canyons of the Jordan Valley and in every deep crevice and cavern and shook every devil in hell. That was good when he said that. But he also said this. His name was Leonard Ravenhill and he said this. Life is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Life is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Well, the question is, are we living today like the master is going to come back sometime tomorrow? Are we living our lives in such a way that we're using what he's given us and, and doing what he's called us to do with it? He, he's coming back again. Amen. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, but he's coming back one day That's right. on a white stallion. Right. Hallelujah. He came the first time as a docile lamb, but he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the roar of the sword from his mouth is going to smite the nations. With one word from his mouth, there's going to be wrath and judgment on the nations and the people that have refused to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us. Help us to hold on to your gospel, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to do what it is that you've yes. called us to do. Yes. He has made us priests and kings unto our God. This brings me to point number two. In order to work for him, we're going to need some help from him. Amen? I said in order to work for him, we're going to need some help from him. Can you go to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5? Jesus is assembled together with his disciples, and this is what he tells them. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days from here. In verse 8 he says, but ye shall receive power... After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, listen, if you read the rest of that particular story, what you'll find out is the disciples are really kind of concerned about their own positions. We've seen this before with these, some of these guys. I mean, look. The disciples were something else. I've, I've talked about this a lot, right? I mean, because a lot of times, I don't know if you grew up in the Catholic Church and you saw these paintings where they had their little halo on their head. That's actually, I don't want to get crazy on you, but that's actually Babylon, Babylonian occultism. Okay, that's not God. That's what you call a, that's, that's why the old Babylonian monks used to shave this little tonsure on their head. It's a, we don't need to get into that, but what I'm trying to say, that doesn't come from the, from the Church of Christ. Amen? It comes from another source. My point being is that they're trying to make us believe that these men were like Jesus, that we can pray to them. You can't pray to them. Come on, Come on somebody. There's one being there between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise God. But the disciples, just like the sons of Zebedee, you remember that? Jesus is over there talking to them about the fact that he's about to go to the cross and they nestle, nestle up to him and they say, hey, Lord, which one of us is going to get to see that you, sit at your right hand? <laughs> he's about to go to the cross and they're worried about who's going to get to sit at his right hand. And now, even in this, whenever Jesus is talking about them waiting in Jerusalem, they're wanting to know, when will you restore the kingdom, Lord? Because they knew of Old Testament prophecies that told of the day when Messiah would rule and reign from Israel again. And that all nations of the earth would pay homage to her. And they knew that they were Israelite of blood and they wanted to have some of that power. Look, it's no different than it was then than it is today. Right, Men Lord. still want power. Right. Now, the difference between what the disciples were doing and what some men today are doing. 
I'm not saying all men. I'm not even saying all men that have been caught up in what I'm trying to, about to talk to you about in just a moment. I'm just saying that a lot of men, they just don't know any better. And if they would hear me say this, if one out of the 15 that clicks on YouTube actually <laughs> happens upon this and they see it, they would probably be very frustrated when they first hear it. But the reality of it is, is that I feel as though I got the right to speak about things that I've experienced myself. Right. Just like I was a Catholic at one time and got saved out of Catholicism, I'll talk about it if I want to. Just as I was a, a person that was bound to drugs and alcohol at one time and the Lord Jesus Christ, not AA, not rehab, I was in three of them, delivered me, I'll talk about it if I want to. I'll say that the psychologist doesn't have the answer. I'll say that rehab doesn't have the answer. I'll say that there's not a 12-step program to set you free. you got to bow your knees at the foot of the cross. I'll say that. And I'll also tell you what I'm about to tell you. There's a lot of charismatic circles in the church, and I had been involved in many of this, where people were flocking to the altar. How many times have you seen, if you've ever grown up in, or been in a charismatic church, where the altar call is, come forward, and the idea is, is that we're going to get in a line, and the man of God is going to lay his hand on us, and we're going to receive a special anointing from him, and then we're, all of our problems are going to be gone. And people flock to the altar, and the next thing you know, people start falling down, and, and people are blowing on them. And oh, preacher, you're getting you're you're getting ready to touch the anointing. No, I'm not touching the anointing. What I'm trying, you show me one time in the New Testament where that happened. Now, am I trying to say that it can't happen? Of course not. In the Old Testament, when Solomon dedicated the temple and they sacrificed all them animals, the Bible says that the high priest could not even stand up because of the glory of God that filled the air. But what I'm trying to say is, if we're going to build half of our doctrine and our church services off of something that, that we're doing each and every weekend, we ought to be able to at least see one sign in the New Testament that this is something that went on. Amen. We ought to be able to see that. But you'll never find it. The closest thing you'll find in the New Testament is whenever the, the temple guard and the Roman soldiers came to get Jesus. And, they, he, and he says to them, he says, whom do you seek? And they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And in the Greek, he said, ego emi, which is what, which was, what was told to Moses through the burning bush. I am, not I am he. I am in the Greek. And they all fell down under the power of God. You can call that the anointing of the Holy Spirit if you want, but I call it chastisement. I call it judgment to knock them down. What I'm trying to say is, is that I'm not trying to speak for everybody in this place, but I can't tell you the countless times I went to the altar. I was like, Lord, you got to deliver me from this spirit of lust. Lord, you got to deliver me from this addiction that I have. Lord, I need your help. And they would lay hands on me, and I can't tell you how many times, and I hope you do watch it, preacher. They would push the head. Yeah. Push the head to try to signal you to go down. It's a lie from the enemy that they're trying to push the head. Amen. I thank God for my sister because she told me one time I was like this. <laughs> I hope my sister didn't watch the video because she got she had calves about that big. <laughs> I tried to push her one time in the kitchen. She like got down. Like, I'm a nose guard boy. Couldn't move her. She said, I ain't going down. But, how, but I will say that there's probably times whenever people thought that they were going to resist it and the Holy Spirit said, oh yeah, and dropped them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. I believe that. I believe that. I do. But I do believe people get caught up in the flesh is what I'm trying to say. People get caught up in the flesh. They think that's the right thing to do and they start doing all that. I don't need all that. I just need the Holy Spirit to show up for real and to do a work. And one of the things that I know is that he made a new and living way through the veil, which is his flesh. His flesh was ripped so that I could go through and enter into the Holy of Holies where his grace abounds, where his presence resides, and I can receive what I need from him. Hallelujah. The Bible teaches that he's already given me victory. And what he did for me at the cross. No, this power that we're speaking of this morning is, it's not a power to make the believer feel good. That's right. Come on, somebody, help me out here. I don't want to say that too many times. I watched my, one of my videos the other day and I kept saying that. Y'all remind me if I say that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's not, a, it's not a power to make us feel good. Amen. Everybody's seeking an emotional experience. That's why we're like children tossed to and fro on the waves. With every wind of doctrine. Oh, here comes something new. Here comes something new. Oh, let me go get in up in this. Let me go get up in this. Let me, get, let me, let me, listen. I, I, I really, I, I've told y'all this before, but 
there was this thing out of out of California where they were talking about a, a glory cloud. I'm not saying that God can't show up in a glory cloud if he wants to do that in the church. I'm not putting God in a box. I'm just trying to make a point that all these people were looking to see this glory cloud. And one time I said, well, what is this glory cloud all about? And I looked and they showed a video and it just looked like a bunch of dust in, in a bright light to me. But all these people were looking to this thing. I mean, I'm not going to get all weirded out on you and start talking about what I think that's all about. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that why are we getting caught up in something that the Old Testament spoke of when now we know that the very glory cloud, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God lives on the inside. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The glory cloud. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, so it's not a power to make man feel good. It's not a power. And it's definitely not a power to make man look good. Right. Come on. Right. A lot of times we got problems, even as preachers. I mean, just admit, admit the truth. Mm -hmm. You just want to look, oh, want to look good. Want to want the, want the people to accept mm -hmm. you, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, but you know what? Sometimes our personality is getting in the way. Yeah. Sometimes our personality is getting away. God wants to move on his people and, and we stand in the way of, of what he's able to do. It says, no, this is not a power to make man look good. This is a power to make God look good. Yeah. Hallelujah. Where the purpose is winning souls, not us receiving some emotional stimulation. That's the word of God. Amen. That ought to sound right. Where the power of God hits you and fills you and now flows out of you and tells other people the good news that you have found. That's right. Amen. And the, and the Lord moves upon their heart and they give their heart to Jesus Christ. This is the strength of the Holy Spirit that brings an explosive power that helps people do what they could not do. You know, Peter, we're about to read a little bit here. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but, but Peter, the Bible says, he said, I go a fishing. And I've, I've explained that to you before that in the, in the Greek, the idea is, is that he was turning his back on what his calling had been. And he was going back to his former way of life to be a fisherman. And the other disciples said, we go with you. That's whenever Jesus showed up on the shore, he was on the water, he showed up on the shore and he fed them. Well, I'm sorry, he was on the shore and he fed them and he began to talk to Peter and he told him to feed his sheep. Mm. But listen, you see a different Peter in Acts chapter 2. You see a different Peter in Acts chapter 2 because Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit and he preaches the first Holy Spirit filled message and 3,000 people get saved on that day. Hallelujah. <laughs> It says it right here in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want to take, I, I didn't even have this in my notes, but every time I preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I have this thing in me that I feel like I got I to gotta start teaching. I just want to make a couple of points because we have a lot of people in here that maybe are not even filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The way that I'm preaching it this morning. What we believe in this church, what we believe in Pentecost, is that when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will speak with other tongues. We believe that that is the initial physical evidence that you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Other subsequent signs that will follow is that you will have a desire to seek the Lord more. And you will have a desire to tell other people about Jesus more so than what you did before. Now, listen, I've seen a whole lot of Baptist people that did not that did not claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That were doing a whole lot more evangelism than most of the Pentecostal people I was talking to. I'm just right. being real with you. So I'm not trying to say I don't agree with with anybody that says that you have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in order to do ministry. I don't believe that. I've seen too many Baptist people just loving on Jesus. I mean, I'm sorry, loving Jesus and loving on people and going, going to other places where Pentecostals weren't going to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ. But many times, even in our churches that we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, sometimes we get a little bit confused between the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues and the gift of tongues. 
The Apostle Paul delineates that in the book of Corinthians. And he tells the Corinthian church, he says, regarding the gifts, you come behind no one. He says, you come behind no one. In other words, you're flowing in all the gifts. But then, I didn't mean to get into this, but, but then he says this. He says, but you're carnal. I never really looked at it that way. Sometimes people think I'm a little bit of a negative preacher, but when something like that sticks out at me, it tells me something. All of these churches that are so focused on the gifts, but at the same time, people can be focused on the gifts and have gifts flowing, and at the same time, be carnal Christians. Yeah. He said, you're of, you say you're of Paul, you're of Apollos, you're of Cephas or Peter. Did, did, did Peter die for your sin? Yeah. Did Apollos die for you? Yeah. No. That's a carn carnal thing. We've got our little favorite preachers, and, and those are the only ones we want to really listen to, you know? But what I'm trying to say is this, is that there's a difference between when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit and you speak with other tongues and it's your initial physical evidence versus after you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Lord may give you the gift of tongues. And when it comes to the gift of tongues being utilized in the church, and we want the gifts utilized in the church, amen? Yeah. When it comes to the gifts of tongues being utilized in the church, a, the way that that would typically go is, is that it might be during service, maybe a pause in the music, uh, you know, before the message, sometimes after the message. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible for it to take place during the message, but at the same time, the Lord, Paul said that there should be order, right? And so what will happen is, is that all of a sudden they'll begin to speak with other tongues. Now, someone may ask the question, what is the other tongue? I see in the scripture where it could be. Now, I, I met, I, I was privileged to meet this man named Stanley Horton, who actually wrote the book of the gifts of the spirit for the assemblies of God. He was about 95. Me and Brad Bullock flew up to Indianapolis and we got to watch him lecture before he passed away. It was his contention that every time a person speaks in another tongue, they're speaking in some form of a human language. And there's a lot of people that believe that. And I'm not, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough languages to say whether that be true or not. But I do know the Apostle Paul said, whether I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, if I have not love, I have nothing. Okay. And so all I'm trying to say is, is that it, all I'm saying is, is that it could be some heavenly language that we don't know anything about. Okay. But nevertheless... It, it comes out in a tongue. And many times, though, what will happen is, is that not only does, whenever it's going to be a gift of tongues utilized, there's also going to be an interpretation that takes place with it. Now, uh, let me just say this, too, since we've got such an, a decent little crowd here this morning for us. Uh, sometimes you may hear somebody during song service praying in tongues. Amen. And they're just maybe a person that's kind of loud when they worship. That does not necessarily mean that they're trying to give a word in tongues. Sometimes people are just worshiping the Lord. Right. The Apostle Paul said, sometimes I pray in the spirit, I pray in my natural language. I sing in the spirit, I sing in my natural language. But then he said this, but I'd rather in public speak five intelligible words than however many thousand words in an unknown tongue. Why? Because he desired to edify others. Yes. He didn't say it was a bad thing to speak in tongues in public. No, but there was a certain order that it needed to be. I hope that that may be at least made it a little bit more clear of what we believe regarding the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues versus, if you will, the, uh, the gift of tongues. But that, that day, on the day of Pentecost, a rushing mighty wind f filled them to overflowing so that they began to speak in other tongues. Some thought that they were drunk. That, that's, that's some of the terminology <clears throat> that's used. Now, it doesn't say that they were falling down. It doesn't say that they were shaking all over the place. It doesn't say that they were flipping and flopping. It doesn't say anything about that. It says they were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. <clears throat> Put up there for me 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, and 8. I have seen various videos of very famous preachers <clears throat> that people flock to their ministries and they're having this type of a service where, where they're laying hands on people and they're doing exactly, I mean, I've actually seen some videos that are, I, I can't even tell you what they were doing, what it looked like they were doing. I can tell you that what I saw in the video didn't look like it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I'm not going to even say it. He says there, let us therefore not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 
The point that I'm trying to make is, is that the Bible is repeatedly exhorting us to be sober, not to be drunk. All these videos that I'm telling you about, they say, oh, oh, oh we're drunk in the spirit. And I've seen all this stuff about people frolicking around, acting like they're all drunk and just all this kind of stuff going on. But the Bible says that we're to be sober. Look at, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for our helmet the hope of salvation. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible repeatedly tells us to be sober. The people thought that everybody, that all these men were drunk because they were speaking in other tongues. And Peter stood up and said, this is not them being drunk as you would suppose, but instead this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of when he spoke about the fact that one day there was going to be both a great harvest that's going to come upon the earth and also a great judgment that's going to come upon the earth. In that passage of scripture that we were just reading in Acts chapter 2, I just wanted you to know that at some point in time, this has been, this has been a, a, a passage of scripture that for years, I, I don't know that I tangled with it, but I, I just, it just kept rolling over in my mind and in my heart. And I tried to talk to other Pentecostal people about it. And I'm not trying to say like I, I, like I know it. I'm just saying that I was seeing something and I guess they weren't as excited about it as I was. <laughs> it says, and the people marveled, saying one to another. So this is the people that thought everybody was drunk. The people marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So the ones that were baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues were Galileans. And then he says, And how is it that we hear every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What, the point that I'm trying to make here is I'm trying to stick to what is the purpose of the power. What is the purpose of the power and what actually happened when they began to speak in other tongues? They all heard people that were of different tribes, different nations, and different tongues. They all heard the wonderful works of God. Jesus said, tarry for me in Jerusalem and you will be endued with power from on high. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the outermost parts of the earth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then it goes on to say this. I do know this much. The point that I'm trying to make is that they all heard in their own language. God's plan is that all of the earth would be able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I may not have it all figured out, but I think, I'll, I think that there's something there to, to see. But I do know this. I do know Jesus said this, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He is the Lord of the harvest. Mm. And I do my part and you do your part. And someone in Asia is faithful with their talents and then we will all sing a new song. Hallelujah. Amen. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sung a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book. And to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by the blood, by your, by your blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to say is that the purpose for the power is to win the souls. Yes. Amen. There will be a separation of wheat and tares and goats and sheep, and there will be a place of hot flames and gnashing teeth. Judgment and harvest. Matthew chapter 3, 11 and 12. Jesus said it. He said, I, I, I'm sorry, John the Baptist said it. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
judgment and harvest in the same passage of Scripture. Judgment and harvest in the same passage of Scripture. You can see a pile of wheat. I've, I've taught this before. And the windowing fan is like a big old pitchfork. And they re, he reaches in there and he grabs it. they got a flattened out floor where the wind can blow. And he keeps throwing the grain and the heavy grain falls down and the chaff blows away. The chaff blows away to be burned. What I'm trying to tell you is that this is a picture of those that are found in Christ. They are the wheat. They are brought and stored into the garner, which is the storehouse of God, meaning that they've entered into the next stage of, of the kingdom of God, but that the chaff or the unbelievers and that they will be burned up. Now, I got to tell you something. There's also a spiritual application here. I believe it. I believe the literal interpretation here is what I just told you. I believe that this is... Both believers and unbelievers. At the same time, there's a personal spiritual application for us to ponder. You know what I mean? What I'm saying by this is all wheat has its own chaff. What I'm trying to say is, is that you and me, we're all kernels of wheat. And we got our own chaff. Mm -hmm. We can sit back and we can look at other people's chaff and we'll be like, oh man, look at your chaff. My chaff don't look like your chaff. <laughs> My chaff ain't as bad as your chaff. I didn't do what you did. <laughs> at least you say you didn't do what we did. Just like all wheat has chaff, all metal has dross. The impurities that are laid in the metal in the refiner's fire has to be heated and stoked so that the impurities rise to the top. Just like all metal has its own dross, all believers have their own sin that needs to be dealt with. I guess you could say that it's the chaff we allow in that will try to stifle the power of God from operating in our lives. You know, I, I, thought, I thought about this, you know, I was just thinking about preachers in general. I mean, I think about Troy, there's other preachers in here. I was thinking about preachers in general. The devil wants to stifle you, and he wants to burden you with sin. He wants to shut your mouth. I can remember there was a preacher that used to be the pastor at Berwick Assembly. And he had left and he came back through and he was over at Crossing Place. And I remember he called me up. He said, stand up, young man. And I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I got very leery for a while about people giving supposed words. And Lord, forgive me. I believe in the gift of prophecy. I do. But sometimes the word is just so generic, and that's yeah. kind of how I took it. I was like, okay. He said, the devil, the Lord wants me to tell you that the devil wants to sift you as wheat. I'm like, but, I know that's right. He wants to sift all of us as wheat. He wanted to sift Peter as wheat. That, that, that's why Jesus said, but I pray that your faith fail not. He's trying to sift every believer as wheat. He's trying to sift every preacher as wheat. He doesn't want you to open your mouth. He wants to burn you down with sin. He wants your chaff to be in the way. He wants your dross to be in the way. He wants the sin to be in the way. He wants to push down the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. And he wants to shut your mouth. And he wants you to remove your head from the plow. And he doesn't want you to move forward in the kingdom and the things of God. That's the devil's plan. Yeah. That was a liar. He doesn't have the last say so. God has the last say so. And the God that we serve is a God of resurrection and a God of restoration. Personal chaff comes in all flavors and sizes. Some people's might be adulteration, and some people's might be fornication, and some people's might be drunkenness. How do you define drunkenness, preacher? Any little bit that's too much that gives you a little bit of a buzz. Better yet, if you're anything like I was, when you take a little sip, next thing you want, you want a gulp. Next thing you want, you want one cup. And when you drink a cup, you're looking at people differently than what you ought to be looking at them. People that you ought not be looking at. Talking in ways you ought not be talking. He called us to be sober. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You do what you want with that. I couldn't just take one little sip. I, I drank to get a buzz. I want to. If I'm going to drink alcohol, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to drink, if I'm going to smoke something, if I'm going to take pills, I'm doing it because I want to get a buzz. I want to do an escape, man. I'm tired of the pain and the things that I'm feeling upon this earth. I want to get away, you know. Back in that, back when I was a teenager, sitting at the house. <laughs> it's not funny, but high school dropout. Like a, the biggest, Lord help me. I'm not even going to say the word. I don't know. <laughs> Sitting there watching TV and in between 
the love boat, <laughs> MTV, <clears throat> in between, man, that, no, I'm not good. In between the love boat and MTV comes that, that Calgon commercial. Y'all, anybody old enough to remember that? That lady got all these kids running around. He's like, Calgon, take me away. She was in this, this, this sudsy, soapy bath, and that bathtub was going to help her, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Things have changed a whole lot since then. We can't hardly get up in the morning without medicating ourselves. We can't even go to work and put in a full day's work without medicating ourselves. We can't get through. Lord, help us. Yeah. Society, if society doesn't have any answers, the doctor's just throwing pills at everything. I'm telling you right now, you go to a general practice doctor and you tell them you've been having pain in your foot, they're going to put you in antidepressant medicine. <laughs> they're going to put everybody on antidepressants. Like it's going to fix something. It's not going to fix anything. Yeah, our brain is who we are. It's our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's our suke. We need the Holy Spirit to reach on the inside of us and to heal us on the inside. Yeah, you got to let your heart be cracked open, man. That's it. You need a heart surgery. But yeah. you got to surrender. You can't put all the walls up and say, you're going to keep you at a distance, Lord. No, you got to let him in. Yeah. He wants to heal. He wants to make whole. He wants to touch. He wants to refine. Hallelujah. He wants to get rid of all that chaff. Oh, I forgot one. If it's not adulteration, fornication, or drunkenness, some people's problem is gossip. <laughs> Proverbs 18.8. In the King James, he says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. But I kind of like the way the ESV says it. It says, the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Oh, I got some news that nobody else has, and I'm about to give it to you. <laughs> just guess what I just found out. Ooh-wee. Don't this feel so good? It's like a, uh, one of them pedophores. You know, them little, them little small kids. Oh, it's so sweet, so moist, so delectable. You know, the reality of it is, is that why do, why does that feel so good? I'm going to tell you, it has to be demonic. If, if something like whispering about somebody else's shortcomings or failures makes you feel good, makes you feel as though you got something out of it, if it stimulates your flesh, then it's no different than all the other things that we talked about. Right. If we're busy running around meddling in other people's business, it's taking away time when we could be ministering to others about the Lord. What's supposed to be delicious to us is a reward from the Lord. Yes. I just wanted to take a quick moment in this message to discuss our personal chaff. I hope that's okay. Another way to say the war between our flesh and the spirit of God in us that wants to work through us. There's a war that's happened. You know, Galatians 5 talks about it. It says that, you know, the spirit's contrary to the flesh. The flesh is contrary to the spirit and that you cannot do what you would. They're fighting one another. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 9, we're talking about a different kind of harvest here. Paul's talking about a harvest of flesh and corruption. He said, Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. Lord, give us strength that we not that we not that we not quit, Lord God, but that we and we not faint. Yes. The one thing that I did learn from this passage I just read is that if you sow flesh seed, you will reap a flesh harvest. If you sow spiritual seed, you will reap a spiritual harvest. That's right, and death, and you will receive life in a spiritual harvest. Praise God. So Peter preached his first Pentecostal message from Joel. We're getting near the end. Just bear with me. Joel 2, 1 through 3. If you could put that up on the, on the board for me. This is what Joel said. I probably shouldn't try to make this funny, but I'm going to do it. <clears throat> Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. This was not funny what happened to me. I got up Friday morning to go open up my door in my Honda Accord that everybody knows I should have got rid of a long time ago. And now I've been operating with the valet key for six months and all of a sudden my lock won't turn. 
I can't even begin to tell you the stress that it took me to get to work, try to see patients, <laughs> talk to all these people. I actually answered the phone in the patient's room on two different occasions because I'm like, look, I just need you to see that I'm really going through something instead of just walking out of this room. So anyway, I get all that rectified. What ends up happening is the guy from Popalot comes. Well, guess what that does? It sets off the alarm. The only way you can stop the alarm on a Honda Accord has got one key entry, and it's on the driver's side, and you got to turn the key two times to the right, and that's the way the lock's broken. So there's no way to turn off the horn. So every time you open up the door, the horn's going off. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I guess I'm just going to drive this vehicle with it on like this, and I'm going to bring it. Hey, dude, that's right, brother. Come on, man. It's the best way to let your pride die. Drive a car like Brother Matt. So I'm driving down the road. Bob, 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 Bob. I get about halfway to the mechanic shop, and all of a sudden it dies. I mean, it doesn't die. The horn stops. I'm like, oh, okay. This isn't that bad. <laughs> and then I started thinking about this passage of scripture. <laughs> I'm like, boy, you can really get somebody's attention like with something like this. Now all I need is a sign on it. Repent. Jesus is coming, amen. <laughs> anyway, thank God for Manuel. I called Robert and I said, dude, please get Manuel to come over here. Anyway, I mean, it was like, you should have seen that guy. He was like a master craftsman, man. He had that. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but it was, but it was funny, huh? Lord help us. Joel said, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord comes, for it is near at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong there has not been ever like them. Neither shall there be any more after it. Now, I got to tell you. I'm not trying to pick on nobody, but it just is what it is. Some people have preached this as though this was God's army. This isn't God's army. This is Antichrist's army. Look what he does. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. During the Great Tribulation, God will use the army of Antichrist just as he used the army of Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon the unbelieving world. And this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing that in the end days, there's going to be judgment. And the apostle uh, Peter, when he preached that Pentecost message, he talked about a day when the wrath of God would be poured upon the earth and that the, that the moon would turn red with blood and that the sun would become black with sackcloth and that there would be a great earthquake and that the rocks would fall upon the people and that they would cry out for help from God. But in the end, there will also be a great harvest. Joel 2 verses 23 through 24 he, see, he said, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, Hallelujah. and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Not only will there be a time of judgment, but there will be a time of great harvest. You know, I previously mentioned Israel and the fact that she was an agrarian society and that she depended upon the former and the latter rains. And the former rain, I believe, I believe is, was the day of Pentecost, whenever the Holy Spirit descended in the upper room and it began the, the, the beginnings of the, of the church of Jesus Christ. It was the beginning of the work of God. It was really the beginning of the end. But then in 1906, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about it. In 1906, another revival happened where there was a, a black man, well, one-eyed black man from Centerville, Louisiana. And, and he was called to go to pastor a church in Los Angeles, California. And on his in, en route to Los Angeles, California, he stopped at a revival service where there was a man named Charles Parham that was preaching a message called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People had been getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. People were speaking in other tongues. And you know what's sad? It's a sad thing that the, that the world used to be this way. I mean, maybe it still is in some places, but I'm glad it's not this way now. The poor, poor, poor Mr. Seymour couldn't even go into the place. He had to sit outside. And he was so hungry, he sat out there. 
And he listened to that message. He listened to that message that that man preached. And then he got back up and he started on his journey. And he showed up. He didn't even receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But he believed. That he could feel it burning in his bones. He knew that something that he was hearing was the right thing. And he ended up going to that church in Los Angeles. And the first time that he preached the message, he preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he ended up going back for the night service. And they had chains on the door. The doors were locked. That started something where he went to preaching in a person's house on Azusa Street. That started the Azusa Street Revival. From there, the baptism of the Holy Spirit spread like wildfire. I'm talking about all over the globe. More people have been saved since that revival took place in the last hundred years than had been saved all before that. A former rain and a latter rain. The former rain was there to prepare the soil to receive the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the latter rain was always there to fill up the harvest, to make it fat, to make it rich, to make it more full before the harvest came. We need a latter rain outpouring in our lives. Yvette, could you come up to the front and play us a song? We need a latter rain outpouring. Today more than ever before. We need you Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us with his fire. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, I got to tell you, Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. I, there, there used to be a time in my ministry whenever I was, I'm just going to be, can I be transparent with y'all? Is that okay? Because I'm not looking to get no kind of accolades from no man. I, there were times when I wouldn't preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I was scared people were going to come up and I get filled. It doesn't matter to me anymore. I just know I'm supposed to preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to get filled. I want everybody to be filled. I want us all to be refilled. But it's ridiculous for me to be so concerned about the outcome of my, of what I call my message that I'm not going to give people the opportunity to get prayed with and also to seek the Lord and to ask Him to fill them up with the Holy Spirit. Same thing with getting saved. Maybe you're in here this morning and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What are you waiting for? Well, what are you waiting for? You need to give your heart to Jesus. Yeah. Amen. So if that's you here this morning, praise God. If you've never been saved and you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to come to the front this morning when she starts to play. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to come to the front and you need to seek the face of God and you need to ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to fill you up to overflowing. If you've been filled before and you need some more, it is not even me. It's not me to just lay hands on you or anybody else in here. It's you to seek the Lord and to ask the Lord to do what he wants to do in you. Amen. Listen, sometimes people just start seeking the Holy Spirit and they receive it later. I've told y'all my story. I think I was saved when I was, I mean, filled when I was about 19. I don't know. I hadn't spoken tongues in forever. My sister had died. I was going through some tragic times, right? And the Lord was dealing with my heart and I was in my car. I even had a dip in my lip and I was listening to this song that these people were singing about Jesus. And I was singing the song about Jesus. And then all of a sudden, it just started flowing out of my innermost belly. Another language that I wasn't even thinking about speaking in tongues. It just started flowing out. I remember Robert told me he was seeking the Lord to fill him up with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He kept asking the Lord, asking the Lord. And it didn't happen the way he expected it. And one day after painting at his uncle's house all day, he was just laying on a bed. And he was singing a song to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, it, it just started coming flowing out. Amen. Flowing out. God will do it the way that he wants to do it, but you got to at least want him to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. As he plays, let's worship the Lord together. Amen. If you need prayer, come to the front. Praise God.